Today I want to speak to you on the subject of how should Christians disagree and debate? How should Christians disagree and debate? Because let's be honest, not all Christians are Christ-like and not all Christians agree. Let me tell you what we're going to learn today in this Bible study together. Uh, number one, I'm going to kind of go over uh, how do Christians fight fairly. Uh, my dad, uh, who's gone home to be with the Lord, was in ministry for over 60 years. He used to say uh, and quote the scripture, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And he used to say that means stay up and fight. <laughs> well, that's not exactly what it means, but we should never carry disagreement and discontentment and contention and bitterness and argumentative uh, attitudes with us uh, in our Christian life and in our walk with the Lord. So we're going to talk about Christians do have disagreements, but how do we fairly debate and deal with those issues according uh, to the Bible? Then I'm going to share with you four biblical rules for engagement. How do we engage in debate and in disagreement, even when we're passionate about it, and still fulfill biblical standards? Four biblical rules of engagement. And then I'm going to share with you four things that you must never do when debating with another believer. We're going to go into Romans chapter 15, if you have your Bible, and we're going to begin reading at verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 7. Romans chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 1, and I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus, then all of you can join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Let's pray together as we begin our Bible study. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for life and health and strength and for all of your blessings. Everything we have that is good in this life comes from your hand and we give you praise. I ask you today by the anointing of the Holy Spirit to quicken every mind, every heart, every life, every listener May their life today be like soil, and may the Word of God be like fertile seed. And I pray that it would be planted into each of us in such manner that we might become more Christ-like in all of our ways. We're reminded of the words in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, where it was written, He must increase, and we must decrease. We need your help with that. And so by the Holy Spirit, convict us when we're not Christ-like. And convict us when there's too much 
of me, myself, and I written on the pages of our day. I ask you, Father, to lead us and guide us in these moments. Let the truth of God penetrate every life. I pray most of all that not one person who comes across this time of study in the Scripture will leave this time unsaved nor uncertain. I pray that every person listening would desire to live ready to meet the Lord. We believe in your soon return and we believe there is nothing more important in all of the world than living ready to meet the Lord. So I pray that by the power of the word of God you would draw them and speak to them. And at the end of our time of study, when we give the invitation and pray the sinner's prayer with those who need to come to you or to come back home, I pray you'd give them the faith and the courage and the humility to do so. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. There in Romans chapter 15, <clears throat> highlight the fifth verse. Uh, all of the Bible is important. But when it comes to the matter of how Christians should disagree and debate, verse 5, written by the Apostle Paul, surely hit the nail on the head. Listen to what he said. I'll read it again. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Paul is telling us that it is God's will that Christians live together in harmony. But do we always live together in harmony? I'm afraid that is not the way it is. A disunity in the body of Christ has been a problem with God's people uh, not just in the 21st century and not just in the day and age of social media, but God's people disagreeing and fighting with one another is found throughout the Bible, even in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is replete with records of civil disagreement, family fights, and worse, with the children of Israel. Almost every local church mentioned in the New Testament, had contentions that they had to deal with. The Corinthians were divided over human leaders, and some of the members of the church were even taking one another to court and suing each other. The Bible tells us concerning the Galatian saints that they were biting and devouring one another. One another. I would say that would be a pretty serious contention. The Greek word used translated in the English, biting and devouring one another, which almost speaks of the viciousness of animals. The saints in Ephesus and also the church at Colossae uh, had to be reminded repeatedly of the importance of Christian unity. The church at Philippi records that two women were at odds with one another, and such a contention uh, came from these two women that they were endeavoring to split the church at Galatia. Even the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter had strong disagreements with one another. Uh, no wonder in the Old Testament in Psalm 133 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Now there are things in the Bible that we disagree on, and I am not saying that it is wrong to disagree. There are always going to be disagreements in the body of Christ. But the study today is focused upon how should Christians 
disagree, deal with contention, debate with one another. I mean, all you have to do is go to my YouTube channel and begin to read the comments underneath from the viewers. And you'll see that the body of Christ is filled with immature believers, vicious believers, accusatory believers. Uh, some will even write, and when I say some, many have said that I'm going to go to hell because I'm not teaching consistently out of the King James Version of the Bible. And uh, some of it is sad. Some of it to me is comical. Uh, some of it obviously reveals uh, the IQ factor of some of the individuals that are responding, and I don't say that in a condescending way. I think it's important sometimes that when you face criticism and when you face debate, you do have to be wise enough to take one step back and consider the source. And I suppose as our content becomes more and more popular and is spread as it already has around the world, it's going to make me, as a Christian leader, as an evangelist, as a student of the Bible, it's going to make me a bigger target. But uh, fortunately, God has given me big enough shoulders and thick enough skin that it'll take a whole lot more than thousands of critics and mean-spirited Christians to move me from the task that God has laid upon my heart. If you have followed my teachings and Bible studies for any length of time, uh, you've heard me say this more than once. As a matter of fact, if you've been following me for uh, a year or two or three or longer, you've heard me say it multiple times. But in your notes, if you've not heard me say this, I want you to make sure you write this in your notes because the Bible is complicated. There are differences of opinions on certain interpretations and so on. But write this down. In essentials, there must be unity. In non-essentials, there must be liberty. And in all things, there must be charity. And I'm going to explain that and define that for you if you're hearing it for the first time. But let me give it to you again for those of you who are taking the time to wisely include this in your life notes and in your Bible study notes. In essentials, there must be unity. In essentials, there must be unity. In non-essentials, there must be liberty. And in all things, there must be charity. And so there really is the keystone uh, to what we're going to build upon today, upon the subject of how do Christians disagree and debate. Uh, I'll come back to that, but let's go into the Bible, into 1 Corinthians and the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians and the 15th chapter. And look at verse 3 and 4. And if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, highlight these two verses in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. I passed on to you what was most important. Pause right there. Paul is defining the fact, the biblical theology, that there are things doctrinally that are most important. In the world of theology, we oftentimes call these the essentials or the essential doctrines or the essential Bible truths. And so you understand that this is not just a phrase that I've invented. I wanted to take you into the Bible before I define it and let you see that it originates in Scripture. Let's read on. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Then he defines 
what is most important. He said, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. And that, my friends, is the definition of the gospel. When you hear somebody say, I'm going to preach the gospel, well, sometimes we use that word a little too carelessly. But if you really want to know what the purity of the gospel is, that's the gospel. The gospel is Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said. That is the essential biblical gospel that is not up for debate, that is not up for disagreement, and can never be divided nor stripped from the pages of Scripture. And let me tell you why. Because if you don't adhere and receive the simplicity of that gospel truth, you cannot be saved. And so essentials are biblical truths that are connected to the doctrine of salvation and they are not up for debate. They are not up for disagreement. And Paul said, I passed on to you what was most important, essential. And what had also been passed on to me as most important or essential. And so that is the essential gospel truth in the Bible. And we make no room for debate on that. Anyone who disagrees that salvation is through the death the burial and the resurrection of Christ alone does not even understand salvation. And I want that to be clear as we move through this study on debate and disagreement. Because there are certain fields of doctrine that we remain immovable on, and these are called essential. By the way, I'll come back to explaining essential, uh, important but not essential, uh, not important, speculation. I'll come back to a thorough definition of this in a Bible study dedicated just to the subject. And so pardon me for today for leaving a lot of meat on that bone, but at least you'll have a fundamental understanding as we walk through and if you don't have it in your notes, be sure to write it down. The essentials are not up for debate. People can disagree, people can receive it, or people can reject it. But we never compromise on essential Bible doctrine. And the most important is the gospel. And the gospel is Jesus Christ. God's only Son lived on this earth, died for our sins, was buried, rose again, promised to return, and we are saved by faith in Christ alone. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Because you see, anyone who doesn't believe that and wants to debate it or disagree, that, my friend, shows you that they're not even a Christian brother or a Christian sister. Mark that well. The essentials are not up for debate. And we don't tolerate disagreement. Now we tolerate questions and we tolerate understanding and we teach and we help and we guide and we counsel. 
But when somebody draws a line in the sand and says, I do not believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe that you can only be saved through Jesus Christ. I don't believe in his death, his burial, or his, or his resurrection. Then, my friend, you not, uh, you not uh, only are dealing with someone who has a disagreement with you. You're having a disagreement with someone that hasn't even attained basic salvation. Uh, let me just cover this very quickly because I want this to be in your notes and as I've already said, I'll come back to it in a later study and deal with it in detail. But let me break down the order of importance of things taught in the Bible. I've already given you number one, that's the, essential, the essentials. Number two would be important but not essential. There are things in the Bible that are important, but they're not essential. And by not essential, I mean your salvation is not negated by a misunderstanding or a varying point of view. Let me give you examples of that. Uh, there within the body of Christ exist people and pastors and denominations who do not agree on modes of baptism, uh, some sprinkle. Uh, some believe in infant baptism. Uh, I personally believe the Bible clearly teaches full immersion of water baptism by a believer who's old enough to understand what they are doing. Uh, another example of things that are important but not essential would be the varying views on Bible prophecy. Uh, many of you know that I teach and preach on Bible prophecy uh, more than any other subject on, on our channel here that you're listening to. There is a tremendous amount of content and there will continue to be because we're living in the end times and I want you to live ready to meet the Lord. But I will be quick to admit to you that there are people who are born again believers who hold some different views on eschatology and end times that I think uh, are misguided or I think they're in proper interpretations of Scripture and I might have a disagreement on the particulars of end time eschatology but it doesn't mean that that brother or sister is not a Christian it just means that we have some varying point of views on certain matters in eschatology and we could go down a long list on that, and we'll deal with that, as I've already said, in a later study. So we have essential, we have important, but not essential, and then we have not important. There are many debates that go on in the church and among Christians and Christians on social media that really are not important. I've heard long uh, debate and accusation and heated attack on whether you should use real wine or grape juice in communion at church. And there are some on one side that say we should uh, use grape juice and never use wine because if we're using wine, then we're causing problems for ex-alcoholics that have been saved and are in our church and real wine might be the trigger that puts them back into a downward spiral and those who believe they should use real wine because they most likely use real wine and people fight over that for hours on social media and things like that. You have to be intelligent enough and mature enough in your faith to realize there are things that are essential, there are things that are important but not essential, and number three, there are things that are not important. Uh, people debate and argue. What, what style of music should we use in the church? What translation of the Bible should a pastor use if they're really anointed? Well, these are not essential to salvation and they're not even qualified to be important. But then lastly, pure speculation. And sadly, Christians get in great debate and disagreement and fight and churches have been split over things that are nothing more than pure speculation. Uh, every Christmas, there are immature believers that come out on social media and they attack people 
over Christmas. What day was Jesus born? Was he born on December 25th? Are there Christmas trees in your house? Are there Christmas trees in your church? You're going to hell if you decorate a Christmas tree. And they go through all of these matters that have nothing to do with the essentials of what the Bible teaches, and they're purely immature believers who have a propensity towards being argumentative and divisive. And the Bible says that believers should not be divided, nor should they cause division in the church. It's not a matter of heaven and hell whether your church has a Christmas tree on the platform or not. But Christians fight over that every Christmas. I've heard Christians on social media arguing, did Adam have a belly button? Really? Get a life. You're going to spend hours on social media going back and forth on speculations as to whether Adam had a belly button or not. And uh, all of these matters fall under what I would call pure speculation. So there in a nutshell is an understanding as to what we debate or what we disagree and certain things that we don't even bother getting into the ring over. And I hope that many of you who follow this ministry will have an upward trajectory in your desire to be an intelligent student of the Bible and to be a mature believer. And I hope that as you learn the Bible with me and as you learn matters pertaining to doctrine in the scriptures, I hope you'll never with that carry an attitude of arrogance. I hope that as you learn the Bible with me that you'll make a commitment to say, Father, I want to learn the Bible, but I always want to cloak myself in a spirit of humility. We don't want to get knowledge from the Bible and then be condescending to a new believer or even a, a, a sage believer that disagrees with us. Arrogance should never be a part of our attitude in those matters. I like what I heard one scholar say. I, I wrote it down. Let me read it to you. He said in one of his books, I often tell people that there are some things which I believe that I would die for. There are some things which I believe that I would lose an arm for. There are some things which I believe that I would lose a finger for. And then there are many things which I believe I would not even give a manicure for. And so that's kind of a very uh, wise, practical way of, of realizing that within the Bible, there are things that are essential and on essential doctrines we stand firm. But when there are disagreements over the complications of certain interpretations, whether it's the matter of the gifts of the Spirit, or the application of divine healing, or the order of end time events, or views and positions on eschatology and so on, we don't allow divisiveness and anger and attack to be a part of of our attitude if we're going to be Christ-like in dealing with other. Uh, now, listen carefully. If you're taking notes, write this down. Let me teach you the rules for Christ-like engagement. Because if you haven't engaged with a believer who disagrees with you, then you have either been hiding out uh, somewhere at home in a dark closet, or you don't get out much. I promise you, if you become a Christian, there are going to be people who disagree with you. You know, one of the things that kind of saddens my heart as an evangelist, as we're seeing hundreds and thousands of people coming to Christ for the very first time through all of our platforms on social media, many times the questions that come my way include, why do Christians disagree? Or I started attending a church, and while I was in a Bible study, why were Christians fighting? I was surprised. I didn't think that Christians would be disrespectful to one another like that. And these are the comments of new believers. And sometimes new believers have a pure, unpolluted heart 
whereby they understand that Christians should be Christ-like when some of us who have been saved for a long period of time have become calloused to how important it is to be Christ-like with one another. So write this down, rules of Christ-like engagement. Number one, be gracious. Learn how to disagree with another believer without getting your ego involved. Your flesh is supposed to be crucified in Christ. And when you cannot disagree with another believer without getting angry or feel, you know, heated or, man, I just want to punch that guy in the nose or, you know, if he says that one more time and looks at me, then we're going out back after Bible study and we'll settle this behind the... Number one, be gracious. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. What I'm teaching you today, I have wrestled with personally. You would have to understand my upbringing. Number one, I'm a preacher's kid. Being a preacher's kid, growing up in public school, had its hurdles. Number two, I'm redheaded. Being redheaded makes me a target as a boy growing up in public schools. Number three, I'm left-handed. It singled me out in the classroom in those elementary days from almost everybody else in the class. And, you know, they thought I was a freak because I couldn't hold my pencil in the right hand. And uh, number four, I have a bad temper, or I should say I used to have a bad temper. Because as a child, as a preacher's kid, and let me tell you something, it probably didn't help that my legal name is Tiffany. Tiffany, redheaded, left-handed, preacher's kid. Ask me if I grew up fighting in school. I fought my whole life. And I'm being honest with you because maybe my transparency will help someone. I got to a point where I enjoyed fighting. I liked knocking people out. Didn't bother me a bit to see blood run out of somebody's nose. I got a, a bit of enjoyment out of that at a certain time in my life. Seeing somebody laying on the flat of their back with blood running out of their nose and, you know, standing over them and say, I guess you won't do that again, will you? I guess you'll think twice before you come in my face and do that. Well, and I'll be honest with you. I used to go to church and I'd go to an altar and I'd kneel down and I'd repent and I'd ask God to forgive me. But most of my childhood and growing up, I had issues with being defensive. Sadly, I knocked two guys out in Bible college in my first semester. And uh, some of you have deleted me from your list of respected preachers. But I feel like I want to share this with people because I've had to learn what I'm trying to teach you. But in Bible college, God delivered me from my temper. And I have never lost my temper from an encounter in a chapel service in the presence of God at the age of 18 until today. Now, it doesn't mean that I still don't have the ability to be confrontational, but now my confrontational attitude is wrapped in Christ-like cords, or at least it should be. But I wrestle with this. I have people that, you know, sometimes will come up to me in a service and make crazy accusations. And I feel my old flesh rise up, you know. I might be smiling at them and holding my Bible and being patient and being courteous, but I'm not going to lie. There's times that the old flesh inside just wants to reach out and grab them by their larynx and set them straight. But you can't do that as a believer. Listen to what I'm about to say and don't miss it. Once you become a Christian, you forfeit your right to ever be unkind to anybody. Once you become a Christian, you forfeit your right to ever be unkind to anyone. Now, there are some people that deserve less than kind behavior, but you have to learn to walk away or to remind yourself that I should be crucified in Christ. I am now an ambassador for the Lord Jesus 
and my words and my conduct and my attitude should strive to be more like Christ and less like myself. John chapter 3 verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. So rules of engagement, number one, be gracious. Go out of your way to crucify your feelings and allow a person to speak even if they tick you off, even if what they're saying is so far down the chart of intelligence that you're insulted by it, be gracious because that exists in the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus taught us in John chapter 13 and verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Rule number one of Christ-like engagement in debate and disagreement, be gracious. Number two, be courteous. Now, let me define that in a way that's very practical. One of the most common courtesies that you can extend to a person when communicating is learn how to be a good listener. One of my pet peeves is when people continually cut other people off. And we've all seen that, where somebody's in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a conversation or in the middle of making a point, and somebody just interrupts them mid-sentence because what they have to say about the matter is more important than the person that's talking. That's not Christ-like. And one of the ways that you can be courteous is even when you disagree with people, let them speak. Let them finish what they have to say. And don't have this look in your eyes as if you're putting up with ignorance. Be gracious, be courteous, listen to them. Because if you listen to them, you might find out why they have the point of view they have, and you might do a better job of trying to communicate the truth as it should be. If you disagree with someone, make sure you express yourself in a way that's not demeaning. Try to disagree with a peaceable spirit. Don't be aggressive and don't be violent and don't be pushy. Be courteous when you disagree with those who disagree with you. Number three, be respectful. Now you've not heard me say that you're always going to agree. You've heard me say the opposite, but let me put an exclamation point on it. There will always be Christians, even in your own church, even in your own fellowship, even in your own family, that you're going to have strong disagreements with. But you can disagree with them strongly without being mean-spirited about it. And on those occasions, maintaining respect is very important. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 15. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. Boy, is that just practical, wise, godly advice. Don't treat people that disagree with you like an enemy. Remember, they're your brother and your sister in Christ. Let me go over four things that you must never do when you disagree or debate another Christian. Put that in your notes. Four things you must never do when you disagree or debate with another Christian. Number one, never question the validity of their Christianity. Don't get all heated and say, well, I guess you're not even a Christian. If you were a real Christian, you couldn't have that point of view. Now, there may be people that you'll meet whose views uh, indeed exclude them from being a real Christian. 
If someone says, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't believe he's God's son, I don't believe he died on a cross, I don't believe he rose from the dead, I don't believe he's coming again, I don't believe he's the only way to have right relationship with God, well, that person has pretty much, by their debate, outlined that they're not a Christian. But I'm not going to attack them and say, well, you're going to hell. Never, ever attack the validity of someone's Christianity because, quite frankly, neither I nor you have access to the book of life. There will be people in heaven you thought would never make it. There will be people absent in heaven you thought sure would make it. And the greatest surprise is if you're there yourself. So walk in that humility. Never, ever attack the validity of someone's Christianity. You're not God's defense attorney. Number two, never attack another believer, another believer personally. Don't attack them personally with personal statements and personal... You're talking about a biblical issue. Keep your disagreement or keep your discussion or keep your debate within the circle of the subject without attacking that person personally. Number three, never demean another person. Don't call them stupid. Don't call them a jackass. Don't call them an idiot. And some people are. But don't attack them verbally and insult them and question their intelligence. You just don't do that. Graceful, godly people abstain from that. And then number four, never engage in retaliation. Don't ever figure out, well, I'm going to retaliate. You said that, or you embarrassed me on social media. Where do you see what I do to you? Never, as a godly Christian, retaliate. Let me give you an illustration of, of something very practical that happened to me many years ago, but uh, there was a pastor uh, who had invited me to come to his church, and he wanted me to come for a week of meetings and speak at his church. And I was happy to do so, but when he connected with me, he gave me one set of dates, and uh, when I got back to him, I said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm already booked on those dates. I cannot come. I'd be happy to come at another time. And, you know, was very gracious with him. He connected with me later, but again, he gave me one set of dates, and uh, it just so happened that my schedule was booked again. You know, uh, years ago, I used to book my schedule one uh, two and some events three years in advance. Uh, I did that when I was younger because when I first started out, I had very few invitations to speak. Nobody knew who I was. And so I think just speaking from a human point of view, I think when I was younger, uh, when I began to get more invitations just out of a, a feeling of security, I tried to make sure that my schedule was full because in those early days, if I wasn't speaking, my children weren't eating. And uh, that is, to this day, our sole means of providing for the ministry and how God uh, provides for this ministry. So it got to the point where I became more well-known that I would book my schedule a year in advance and then two years in advance and certain conferences and camps three years in advance. But I soon figured out that it had gotten to the point where my schedule was dictating me instead of me dictating my schedule. And I don't do that anymore. I still have to book uh, quite a long ways in advance. I have more invitations for this current year than I can get in my schedule, but I have not loaded my schedule because I've learned I want to be led by the Lord. I want to be more systematic about where God asks me to go. And so the second time that this man asked me, my calendar was booked again. He got mad at me. I could tell in our communication that he was thinking I didn't want to go to his church. And it wasn't a small church. It was a large church. And uh, I can only speculate, but 
I, I almost felt like he was insulted that uh, here I am inviting you to come and you're not wanting to come to my church. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know how big our church is? You know, whoever you have on the schedule, you know, you should, you know, cancel them for me. I mean, he didn't say that, but I just got this feeling that he was really upset with me. And then I never heard from him again. And I was as gracious to him in all of my communications as I'm speaking with you now. Then I heard from a pastor. And he was a friend of mine. And he called me and he said, we were in conversation. He said, Tiff, there's something that's bothering me. Do you mind if I talk to you about something personal? I said, well, of course not. We're dear friends. He said, as your ministry has become larger, he said, I... I'm disappointed. I said, you know, I was perplexed. I said, about what? He said, I heard that you now charge $2,500 a night to make an appearance. And I jokingly said, who told you I'd come for that cheap? And uh, I, I laughed and I said, are, are you serious? Let me tell you something. I'm 63 years old. I've been in ministry for over 43 years. I have never charged one single penny of anybody. You will not find one person in 43 years of traveling the world who can show you a letter from my office that had requirements. I pay for my own plane tickets. I pay for my own hotels. I don't ask for a penny. Now, there are certain churches and certain events that I speak at that uh, have known me for years and the church has an attitude that, you know, you're not paying for your accommodations when you're here. We'll take care of your accommodations or, you know, where I was just at. Uh, the pastor said, uh, give our CFO a copy of your flight. We'll reimburse you for your flight. I said, pastor, I said, all of the years you've known me. I said, have I ever charged you for a flight? Have I ever charged you for a hotel? Have I charged you for anything? No, but around here. That's how we do it. I said, well, that's between you and your treasurer, but I'm not going to send you a bill. I've never charged anybody anything. Long story short, I found out that the pastor who I wasn't able to connect with on those two dates retaliated against me by spreading rumors all around that the reason I wouldn't come to his church is because I charged X amount of dollars per night. And it was a total lie. Total lie. That's retaliation. And believers and godly people don't retaliate. I never called that pastor. Never asked him. Never made accusation. I mean, probably a good thing I didn't see him for about six months because I was, uh, <laughs> I was wanting to teach him a lesson. I've already confessed to you that I live in a body of flesh just like, you, like I do. I mean, it irritated me because he was attacking my character and lying. Even a, a large Christian leader called me in my circle of accountability and said, Tiff, when did you start charging X amount of dollars a night? I said, I never did. The pastor in such and such a church started that rumor about me and I'm just going to let it go. Don't do that. A godly person doesn't retaliate. And let me take it one step further. A godly, humble person doesn't feel a need to defend themselves. God is my defender. God is your defender. Refrain from being a believer who cannot disagree nor debate with another believer without getting personal, without demeaning the believer, without attacking their faith, because you're going to spend your eternity with many of these people. Let me tell you something. Many of the people that you disagree with, you don't know them. And probably if you knew them, you might have a different view. I'm not going to do it because I don't name pastors publicly in, in the, the pulpit or in media but I have had the privilege of meeting some very notable people in ministry on that stage of what some would call celebrity. And do you know what? Many of these people are viciously attacked by other pastors, by other leaders, by other Christians, by the evangelists, and so on. And they've never met them. They don't know them. 
And once I've met some of these people and had fellowship with them and got to know them, who they are compared to what everybody said they were like, two different people. And that could be true for you. People can attack you and spread rumors about you and say things about you, and they don't even know you. If they got to know you, they might realize that you're more Christ-like than their accusations. But we must never retaliate, and we must never try to viciously defend ourselves. We belong to Christ, and Christ is our protector. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Lastly, and I close with this, be a peacemaker. It should be your goal, if you're Christ-like, if you're humble, if you're secure in who you are in Christ, it should always be your goal to be a peacemaker, not to be divisive. The Bible tells us, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification in Romans chapter 14. As a matter of fact, let's go into Romans 14 as I close. Let me give you one more passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. Romans chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Verse 19 says, let us aim for harmony in the church. Would it be said of you in your church fellowship that you're a peacemaker? You're an individual who is always striving to be harmonious. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 2 through 6, the Bible says always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. One day, you and I, will stand before God. If you're a believer, you're going to stand before God and the Bible says you're going to give an account for every idle word. The Apostle Paul in uh, Romans, uh, I believe it's the 14th chapter, wrote this, Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 13. Why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance, praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and to fall. I hope that our Bible study today perhaps has given you new insights, and not my counsel and not my opinion, but straight from the pages of the Bible. How should Christians disagree and debate with one another? We have covered the biblical principles, and all mature, and all Christ-like believers. Again, I want to be clear, I'm not saying you'll never have a disagreement. You will. 
I'm not saying you'll never be involved in a debate with another believer. You will. But now you have the biblical rules for engagement. You have a biblical understanding for how your flesh has to be subservient to the nature of Christ within you. That you treat other people with grace and respect and love. And you always strive to be a peacemaker. Do you have peace with God? Because you'll never be a peacemaker with men. Listen carefully. You'll never be successful at being a peacemaker with men and women and other people if you have not first made peace with God. How do you have peace with God? Well, it's very simple. Number one, you have to recognize God's holy. God's holy. Number two, you have to recognize we by nature are not holy. We by nature have a propensity towards sin and selfishness. Number three, you have to be willing to repent of that. To go to God in humility and say, God, I've sinned. I've fallen short of your glory. I've broken commandments. I have violated many of these biblical truths. But I want to live in right relationship with God. I want to have peace with God. You can't have peace with others until you first understand the foundation of peace. And that peace comes from right relationship with God. Would you pray with me right now? Many of you that are listening to me, maybe you don't have the assurance that your heart is right with God, that your sins are forgiven, that God is truly your heavenly Father. Will you pray with me wherever you're at, just right now, say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, down deep in my heart, I want to be Christ-like. I want to be what you called me to be. I recognize my sin. And today I'm willing to repent. In childlike faith, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. I believe He is the Son of God, that He lived and died, was buried, rose again, and is coming very soon. Keep me ready for that appointed hour. Today as I have repented of sin, I receive Jesus Christ and the gift of salvation come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I vow I will serve the Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me your strength to be what I ought to be. In Jesus' name, amen.